Greetings once again. This is Pastor Rick, and I welcome you to my weekly sermon series. Today's message is called, He is Holy. The subtitle is Worship in Progress. The message here is that when God's people forget who they are in this world and what they have to hope for, well, the heart of this message is that we must inquire of the Lord because He is holy. Our primary text here is 1 Corinthians 13, uh, verse 1 through 16, verse 6. I actually printed all that out to see what it would go on my PowerPoint. And on just full-size pages, it was 10 pages. So it would have been 10 pages of me reading the Bible to you, which would have been fascinating. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to come back to those when they serve the, the purpose of what I'm talking about here. So for most of my sermons, I introduce the biblical text and then I read it to you and I see how it shapes the message. But for today, our text for the message, which is he is holy, um, it's going to um, bring those verses in at the right times. So what I chose to do was to put the text in where they belong, as I do in all my sermons. And here's my recommendation. Sit with your Bible open to 1 Chronicles chapter 13 and then follow along with me. It'll be pretty easy. He is holy. So what we are studying here is that sometimes God's people forget who they are in this world and what they need to hope for. The key is this. We must inquire of the Lord because he is holy. In our Bible story today, the newly crowned King David called for a kind of national reunion, complete with a unique parade. The focus of all this was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was that gold-covered box with angels on top that was originally at the heart of the tabernacle and the elaborate tent structure that God told Moses to build as the focus of Israel's worship. By David's day, the Ark itself had been separated from the rest of the tabernacle, also called the Tent of Meeting, and the Ark had been in, in uh, storage at the home of a guy named Abinadab for about 20 years. The newly crowned King David called for a kind of national reunion, complete with a unique parade. As we go through this message, I'll mix texts from Scripture, my own observations, and texts from others, all focused on worshiping God. 1 Chronicles 13, verse 14. The Ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house for three months, and the Lord blessed his household and everything he had. Now, Let's go back a little bit on this at the beginning of 1 Chronicles 13, where it says, bringing back the ark. David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. He then said to the whole assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our people throughout the territories of Israel, and also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands, to come and join us. Israel had a new capital city, Jerusalem, the city of David. He wanted to leave the ways of his predecessor, Saul, behind, because Saul had not inquired of the Lord. Chronicles makes a big deal of the contrast between Saul and David. David is not going to govern like Saul, so he wants to bring the ark out of mothballs and move it to the capital city of Jerusalem. He wanted, he wanted God to be at the center of his kingdom's life. The movement of the ark was a big parade with people from all over the kingdom following the new ox cart, carrying the golden ark with the shining angels and then the cherubim on top. The cart itself lurched along on the primitive road, traveling the eight miles to Jerusalem. Two of Abinadab's sons, Uzzah and Ahio, young men who had grown up with this ark on their property, who were as familiar with this treasure as you are with your grandmother's china closet in your dining room, were put in charge of keeping an eye on it. I imagine them walking along in their farmer work shirts and blue jeans, a bit embarrassed but proud of all the attention they were getting. They weren't Levites or priests, just a couple of farm boys guarding this old relic. So let's return to um, Chronicles. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us. For we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. The whole assembly agreed to do this because it seemed tight, excuse me, it seemed right to do all to all the people. 
So David assembled all Israel from the Shahar River in Egypt to Lebo Hamath to bring the Ark of God from Kirith Jerem. David and all Israel went to Bela of Judah, Kirith Jerem is another name for it, to bring up from there the Ark of God the Lord, who is enthroned between the cherubim, the Ark that is called by the name, that's a capital name. It doesn't give you a name, it just says name with a capital name. They moved the Ark of God from Abinadab's house on a new cart with Uzziah and Ahio guarding it. David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before God, with songs and with harps, lyres, timbrels, cymbals, and trumpets. Now what happened next seemed like nothing to worry about. They were passing a farmer's threshing floor when one ox caught its hoof on a rough place, stumbled, and caused the cart to lurch, and the ark shifted. First Chronicles 13.9 when they came to the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark because the oxen stumbled. The ark's anger burned, the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah, and he struck him down because he had put his hand on the ark. So he died there before God. The parade stopped in its tracks. The music died out in a wave spreading back down the line. People were saying, what? What happened? And at the front of the line, behind the ox cart, David was stunned. Speechless, Uzzah had attempted to catch the falling ark, and because he touched it, the Lord struck him dead. David was angry. First Chronicles 13, verse 11 through 14. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of God that day and asked, How can I ever bring the ark of God to me? He did not take the ark to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, a Gittite. The Ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house for three months, and the Lord blessed his household and everything he had. Now, Perez Uzzah means outbreak against Uzzah. Remember that expression, the Lord's wrath had broken out. David was thinking, what did we do wrong? What kind of God are you? Then the Bible says that David became afraid. He parked the ark right there in the nearest driveway, belonging to a guy named Obed-Edom, and everyone trudged home in bewildered silence. The story of Uzzah, the ark, and the ox cart is hanging in the air, and everyone who hears it is thinking, what's up with that? Then the chronicler completely changes the subject. First Chronicles 14, the first two verses. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messages to David, along with cedar logs, stone masons, and carpenters to build a palace for him. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, and that his kingdom had been highly exalted for the sake of his people, Israel. Now verses 1 and 2 tell how King Hiram of Tyre to Israel's north kindly provided all the materials for David's new palace in Jerusalem. And verses 3 to 6 reveal the names of the children who will be born to David in the years ahead. King Hiram of Tyre, which is to Israel's north, kindly provided all the materials for David's new palace in Jerusalem. And verses 3 to 6 tell about all the children born to David in the years ahead. 1 Chronicles 14, starting with verse 3. In Jerusalem, David took more wives and became the father of more sons and daughters. These are the names of the children born to him there. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon. Ibhar, Elashua, Epil, Noga, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Bealide, Bealiada, and Eliphilet. I, I doubt that anybody's got that name, so they probably won't have any problem with it. But we're still thinking about Uzzah. What about his house and his family? Well, the storyteller forges on telling two stories about how David defeated Israel's arch enemy, the Philistines. So let's listen to the first story in verses 8 through 12. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went out to meet them. Now the Philistines had come and raided the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of God, Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered him, Go, I will deliver them into your hands. The main focus of all this was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was a gold-covered box with angels on top, presented at the heart of the tabernacle. 
It's an elaborate in a in an elaborate tent structure that God told Moses to build as the focus of Israel's worship. By David's day, the ark itself had been separated from the rest of the tabernacle, also called the tent of meeting. And the ark had been in stage at the home of a guy named Abinadab for about 20 years. David was establishing a new kind of kingdom. Starting in verse 11. So David and his men went up to Baal Perazim, and there he defeated them. He said, as waters break out, God has broken out against my enemies by my hand. So that place was called Baal Perazim. Perazim, Perazim. The Philistines had abandoned their gods there, and David gave orders to burn them in the fire. So we need to look for some specific things here. First, that David inquired of God. That's very important to remember. He didn't just go out on his own. He inquired of God. He asked. And what happened? That led to his victory. Now, second, did you notice the expression, as waters break out, God has broken out against my enemies? Well, that's the word, broken, used in the story where God broke out against Uzzah. Again, the place name. Baal Perazim, which means the Lord who breaks out. And notice what David did with their gods. David gave orders to burn them in the fire. David burned them all, the ultimate indictment of their powerlessness. First Chronicles 14, verses 13 through 16. Once more the Philistines raided the valley. So David inquired of God again, and God answered him. Do not go directly after them, but circle around them and attack them in front of the poplar trees. As soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the poplar trees, move out to battle, because that will mean God has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. So David did as God commanded him, and they struck down the Philistine army all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. Or Gezer. The second story in verses 13 through 16 is much the same. The Philistines raid. David inquires of the Lord. God gives him a unique strategy for victory. David follows it, and the Philistines are beat. Verse 17 sums up what happened. So David's fame spread throughout every land, and the Lord made all the nations fear him. The movement of the ark was a big parade with people from all over the kingdom following that new ox cart that was carrying the golden ark with the shining angels cherubim on top. The cart itself lurched along on the primitive road, traveling the eight miles to Jerusalem. Now, two of Abinadab's sons, Uzzah and Ahio, young men who had grown up with this ark on their property, who were as familiar with this treasure as you are with Grandma's china closet in your dining room, were put in charge of keeping an eye on it. I imagine them walking along in their farmer work shirts and blue jeans, a bit embarrassed, but proud of all the attention they were getting. They weren't Levites or priests, just a couple of farm boys guarding this old relic. So what happened next seemed insignificant. They were passing a certain farmer's threshing floor when one ox caught its hoof on a rough place, stumbled a little, the cart lurched, the ark shifted. The parade stopped in its tracks. The music died out in a wave spreading back down the line. People were saying, wait, what happened? And at the front of the line, behind the ox cart, David was stunned. Speechless, Uzzah had attempted to catch the falling ark, and because he touched it, the Lord struck him dead. Then David was angry. First Chronicles 13, 11. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. Now, Perez Uzzah means outbreak against Uzzah. Remember that expression. The Lord's wrath had broken out. David was thinking, what's the deal? What kind of God are you? Then the Bible says that David became afraid. He parked the ark right there in the nearest driveway, belonging to a guy named Obed-Edom, and everyone trudged home in bewildered silence. David leaves behind the unfinished story of Uzzah, the ark, and the ox cart hanging in the air, and everyone who hears it is thinking, what happened? Then the chronicler completely changes the subject. I'm going to repeat some scripture references because they're necessary for the foundation of this sermon. 1 Chronicles 14, 1 and 2. 
Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messages to David along with cedar logs, stone masons, and carpenters to build a palace for him. And David knew that the Lord had astonished, excuse me, had established him as king over Israel, and that his kingdom had been highly exalted for the sake of his people, Israel. King Hiram of Tyre, which is to Israel's north, kindly provided all the materials for David's new palace in Jerusalem. In verses 3 to 6, tell about all the children born to David in the years ahead. But we're still thinking about Uzzah. What about his house and kids? Well, the storyteller forges on, telling two stories about how David defeated Israel's archenemy, the Philistines. Listen to the first story in verses 8 through 12. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went out to meet them. Now the Philistines had come and raided the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of God, Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered him, Go, I will deliver them into your hands. So David and his men went up to Baal Perazim, and there he defeated them. He said, As waters break out, God has broken out against my enemies by my hand. So that place was called Baal Perazim. Perazim. You say Perazim, I say Perazim. Let's just move on. The Philistines had abandoned their gods there, and David gave orders to burn them in the fire. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went out to meet them. Now the Philistines had come and raided the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of God, Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered him, Go, I will deliver them into your hands. So David and his men went up to Baal Perazim, and there he defeated them. He said, As waters break out, God has broken out against my enemies by my hand. So that place was called Baal Perazim, or Perazim. The Philistines had abandoned their gods there, and David gave orders to burn them in the fire. David becomes king over Israel. This is a big deal. We find it in 2 Samuel 5, the first five verses. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and then anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. David had a pretty powerful kingdom. Here's the strange thing. According to Samuel 5, chapter 5 and 6, these stories actually happened before the incident with Uzzah in the ark. The chronicler, the chronicler, the guy that wrote the chronics, I don't know, the chronicler, Sounds weird. He employs a kind of flashback. It's as if he sets up with the story about Uzzah's death for touching God's ark, leaving us hanging, angry, and afraid like David, wondering what kind of God we serve who strikes men dead like that. Then he reminds us of all these other stories about all the ways God blessed David, the favor of a foreign king, all his children, the stunning victories over enemies, as if to say, he's the same God, the same God as the one who struck Uzzah dead. What do you make of that? Well, here's what we must make of it. There is no doubt that God faithfully blesses his people when we seek him. The chronicler gives us this flashback to say, don't get the wrong idea about God. God is not unpredictable, short-tempered, and unreasonable. The fact is, our God faithfully blesses his people. That is what God is like in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and today. Take Obed-Edom, the guy on whose property they stashed the ark. Look back at 1 Chronicles 13, verse 14. There is no doubt that God faithfully blesses his people when we see him. The chronicler gives us this flashback to say, don't get the wrong idea about our God. God is not unpredictable, short-tempered, or unreasonable. The fact is, our God faithfully blesses his people. That is what God is like in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and today. Take Obed-Edom, for example, the guy on whose property they stashed the ark. 
Let's look back at 1 Chronicles 13, verse 14. The ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house for three months, and the Lord blessed his household and everything he had. Now, we learn later that Obed-Edom is a good man, highly respected in Israel. When God takes up residence in the home of someone like that, good things happen. Blessing is God's default pattern. It's his normal way. The key to living in God's love and blessing is to inquire of the Lord and then to seek him. Those two synonymous phrases are key in his book. Inquire of the Lord, meaning asking him questions, and then seek him. Go gather his presence. Come to his presence. Be in his presence. Remember, that is what King Saul did not do. The reason for bringing the ark to Jerusalem was so Israel could inquire of God and seek him. We cannot just inquire of God when we're at our wit's end, when we've tried everything else we would think of first. God doesn't expect us to handle things ourselves and only call on him if it's really out of hand. Seeking God is to be our way of life. It's an act of humility of, of a servant on all occasions of life saying to his master, what would you have me do now? Inquire of God even when you think you know what to do. Somewhere recently I read a story where the writer said of a certain woman, she prayed about everything. I can't remember anything else of the story, but I know this. God blessed that woman's life. Now, there is this goofy idea in the world that one must be very choosy about what when to bother God. Lord, people say, I know you're busy and have lots on your mind, but I need your help. Or they say, I don't want to bother God with my little problems. Well, that's ridiculous. How can God be too busy? God has the entire universe, places that we don't even know exist, and he's running those pretty good, I would imagine. God cannot have too much on his mind. His mind doesn't go too much. His mind is all. Nobody ever bothers God by inquiring of him. The Bible says again and again that if you want God's blessing on your life, always inquire of him. Always seek his face as you sort out what to do. Deuteronomy 4 verse 7. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? Psalms 50 verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. Matthew 7, verse 7, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be, right, open to you. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There are things going on right now in your life where you need to inquire of God. Directions you're choosing, decisions you're making. God blesses the person, the church, the nation who will seek him, period. It's as simple as that. But what about Uzzah? Yes, now that the chronicler, now the chronicler, chronicler, <laughs> I'm getting so hung up on that. Now the chronicler takes us back to Uzzah. Now that we're clear that God faithfully blesses his people, in chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, the chronicler writes, After David had constructed buildings for himself in the city of David, he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, No one but the Levites may carry the ark of God, because the Lord chose them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister before him forever. But David assembled all Israel in Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to the place he had prepared for it. He called together the descendants of Aaron and the Levites. David brings all these Levites together, and then he confesses that before we did not inquire of the Lord about how to transport the ark in the, trans in the prescribed way. They had used two farm boys in work clothes instead of, Levi instead of um, Levites in white linen. The ark was an ox cart instead of being carried on poles lifted high on the priest's shoulders out of reach. It didn't matter that all the people were praising God. It didn't matter that they had the right idea about returning God to the center of national life. When we forget that God is holy, we are in danger. As God's people, we must always reckon with his holiness. Why was the penalty for casually touching God's holy ark so severe? Because if we do not understand God's holiness, we will never understand God's salvation. 
the risk God takes in coming near enough to love us personally is that we will, quote, communize, that's a variety of communion, meaning commune together, it's not a communistic word, communize, him. We communize with him. We communicate with him. We, we join together with him. He will think he is like us, but God is utterly perfect and perfectly sinless. If we minimize this holiness, then our sinfulness does not seem like such a big deal. If that happens, we minimize our need for a great salvation. The Son of God dying on the cross makes no sense. We lose any sense of our vulnerability to God's judgment. We may come to believe that God loves and saves everybody and all dogs go to heaven. But a story like this one of Uzzah is a wake-up call. Eugene Peterson wrote, and I like Eugene Peterson, Sometimes I think that all the religious sites should be posted with signs reading, Beware the God. Not beware the dog. Beware the God. That's pretty cool. The places and occasions that people gather to attend to God are dangerous. They're glorious places and occasions, true, but they're also dangerous. Danger signs should be conspicuously placed as they are at nuclear power stations, as they are at nuclear power stations. Now, I know a little bit about that because when I was working for Southern California Edison, training people to use voice software so they didn't have to use their hands, um, I went down to the, the plant several times and I got taken around and shown where everything was and, and such. It's a pretty powerful place. Um, it's unfortunate that they closed it down because I think that we could have used nuclear power for many, many more years. Um, let's see. Danger signs should be conspicuously placed as they are at nuclear power stations. Religion is the death of some people. The story of Uzzah and David posts the warning and tells the glory. Uh, that's a little excerpt from a, a book I was reading, Leap Over a Wall. Now, when it comes to knowing how to handle yourself in the presence of the Holy God, never trust your instincts. Always inquire of the Lord. Your instincts will be selfish. God's instincts will be salvation. The Bible is the only reliable source of how to come into the presence of the Holy God. David didn't look up in Scripture how the ark was to be transported. After all, what's the big deal? How hard is it? But God will not be treated as religious baggage. He will not be hauled along like a steamer trunk or an ox cart. King David himself would not have entered Jerusalem bouncing along on an ox cart. There was no way to treat a king. God had given clear instructions about transporting the ark, and David found them when he finally looked. People are forever thinking they can approach God when and where and how they wish. But that is a most dangerous error. For us, there is no need of priests in white linen carrying the golden ark on their shoulders. But there is this. The right approach to our holy God is to celebrate with all our might. For the first time in Israelite worship, David appointed musicians of every kind to help. John 14, verses 6 through 7. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So should people who grasp holiness cower in fear? No, not if they love and serve God. The right approach to our holy God is to celebrate with all our might. For the first time in Israelite worship, David appointed musicians of every kind to help. Yes, I did repeat that, but I wanted to. 1 Chronicles 15, verses 25 to 28. So David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of units of a thousand went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with a rejoicing. <clears throat> because God had helped the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, seven bulls and seven rams were sacrificed. Now David was clothed in a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who were carrying the ark and the musicians, and Kenaniah, who was in charge of the singing of the choirs. David also wore a linen ephod. So all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouts, with the sounding of ram's horns and trumpets and of cymbals, and the playing of lyres and harps. Now it says elsewhere that David celebrated with all his might. 2 Samuel 6, 14, 15, wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. 
while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. The holy God is among us. He is our God. He will fight our battles. He will call us his people. He will love us, and incredibly, he will sacrifice his only son so that we too might become holy, and he will bring us to live with him eternally. That is all true. But there's a sour note in verse 29. 1 Chronicles 15, 29, as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David dancing and celebrating, she despised him in her heart. 2 Samuel 6, 20-23, when David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. 2 Samuel 6 says that Michael thought David was humiliating himself carrying on like that. Michael is the last vestige of Saul in this story. She was a chip off the old block with the godless heart of Saul. Some things never change. Those who do not know our God will despise our passion for him. I dug out this old African proverb for just a moment like this. Those who do not hear the music think the dancer is mad. We hear in our relationship with God a music that ought to make us sing, bang on tambourines and dance, but expect the others to think we are mad for loving God so passionately. I held off on verse 23 because it's a sad moment. 2 Samuel 6, 23, And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children the day of her death, all because of her attitude. And that's it. Let me pray for you in me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that I've been able to put this sermon together. I had some research that was already done. That was helpful too. Thank you uh, for guiding me into the right direction of how to play these things and to put these together. I ask that for all of my listeners that you would enjoy um, receiving these messages. Uh, let me know if you do. If you don't, uh, I'm not, I, I have a different uh, email name for you. <laughs> not kidding. Um, and I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us and for everyone that's listening to this message and reading it. Um, I pray also, Lord, that you would heal my wife, help her to heal much stronger than what she is now. She really needs help. And for all of you out there who are listening, to this uh, message, I ask you to please pray for her also. Her name is Vicki. We call her Pastor Vicki. And uh, she just really has a lot of problems that God needs to come in and fix for us. And I would really appreciate it, your prayer. So that's it. Amen.